Good afternoon, everybody. Settle down, guys. Settle down. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder before we start today that uh, next week is the AIHA annual general meeting, so we will not be having seminar. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to my BCCDC colleague, Dr. Rashid Zatouni, who is our provincial radiation specialist. Uh, this man might know more about health physics than anybody else in the province, I think. Uh, so he can be a very valuable resource for you if you're interested in questions uh, related to radiation. I'm just going to give you a little bit of his background because he's had a very distinguished career. Um, his BSc comes from, is in solid state physics from Constantine University in Algeria, and then his MSc and PhDs in health physics and nuclear science. Uh, we're from Georgia Institute of Technology. He's been at the BCCDC since 2011, but prior to that, he was working in Dubai as a consultant medical physicist and radiation protection advisor. And prior to that, he was at, in his home in Algeria as a senior health physicist. So, but welcome, Rashid. I'm pleased to be here to do a presentation again. Last year, we had one on radio frequency uh, radiation. So I chose to talk about this topic because I suspect it will be an interesting population health issue in the future. And the reason is everybody gets x-rays in dentistry all the population, so it concerns everybody. Uh, there, there, is not, there are not too many projects, uh, especially research, about the, uh, the impact of the population. But in dental radiology, radiation doses are small, but the population is very large. Okay, and I'll show you some numbers that are amazing. It's the most frequent type of diagnostic x-ray procedures among all x-ray procedures in medicine, dental x-rays are the most frequent uh, uh, practice. They account for about 21 to 25 percent of total x-ray examinations. Back in 2000, NSCARE, which is a United Nations uh, body, they evaluated the number of dental x-ray examinations to about 500 million, and that was 14 years ago. So you can see the very large number of people getting exposed to x-rays from early age to late in life. And what worries us as health physicists is not the dose that everybody gets in dental radiology, but what we call the collective dose. In our field, Radiation risk is linked to collective doses, not to individual doses. It's statistics, and the collective dose is the average dose that a patient gets multiplied by the number of people who get these examinations. And collective doses in dental radiology are much, much higher than in radiology, for example. And that's not to forget that in addition to dental x-rays, sometimes we need X-rays in radiology to image the abdomen or to image chest or the brain. Or if we have a fracture somewhere, we have to image bone. And let's not forget uh, nuclear medicine sometimes. Uh, in nuclear medicine, they do functional studies. They image how organs are functioning. So for people who need nuclear medicine examination, that's an additional source uh, of exposure. And of course, for radiotherapy, I wouldn't talk about radiotherapy because it's for treatment. So we, we are exposed to all kinds of radiation sources, including the natural sources. When we travel in air, we get higher doses. Uh, some foods have contained radioactive material. Our walls contain radioactive material. We inhale radon inside our sources. That's too many sources. So. I think the goal in the future is try to limit all these doses because when they add up, they could be significant. So let me talk about the dental x-ray procedures first. 
There are mainly four procedures. Intraoral x-rays, panoramic x-rays, cephalometric x-rays, and recently 3D x-rays with dental cone beam CT. And let me just go uh, and describe each one. Intraoral is called intraoral because the image receptor, which used to be film and today is a digital sensor, is put inside the mouth to get an image. And you probably, you all probably had x-rays at the first visit at the dentist. So they ask you to put a film inside the mouth and then the image. Or like to the nowadays, most of the machines are digital. They ask you to put a digital sensor and they get the image. And there are different kinds of enteral x-rays. The bite wing, which is the image of the crowns of top and bottom teeth. Periapical, which is the image of the full tooth. Occlusal, where you put a film between the teeth and then they look at either the upper or lower jaw. And then you have full mouth series, and I'm not even sure that they do that anymore. It's about eight uh, projections to get image of the full mouth. And it is usually done also at first visit. And that's what we call intraoral, where the receptor is put inside the mouth. The other ones are all extraoral because the receptor is outside the head. So panoramic is a procedure where the, the, the x-ray generator and the receptor rotate around the patient's head to get an image of the full mouth. And this is is an example of the kind of image we get. And uh, for example, for braces, dentists have to do that before they place braces because they want to have a clear picture uh, of the two jaws. Cephalometric is, in Greek or in some languages, cephalo re refers to head. So cephalometric x-rays are images of the head. They can be profiled in profile position or in posterior, anterior, uh, position. These are the two uh, procedures uh, in this case. And this is, of course, and this is to look at the head, okay, the jaws, but also the, uh, the skull. And the third one, and the most recent one, which is a 3D imaging procedure, it's called Dome Dental Cone Beam CT. And you have to rely on 3D imaging to get a full picture. So main applications are the developing dentition, restoring the dentition, and surgical applications. And uh, dental CBCT, you know, the patient can be standing up or can be sitting. But we'll collect more data to generate a 3D image of the maxillary and the mandible. Okay. And it's called cone beam because it's wide. The, the X-ray generator sends a wide beam to image the full head or to image the part that is under, under investigation. It takes about 20 seconds for the rotation to complete. And one of the uh, hard things here is to keep the patient uh, still, not moving, because if the patient moves, they have to redo it. And that's a big problem because CBCT already uh, delivers a high dose, and if you have to repeat, that dose is doubled, which is not good. In general, in radiology, uh, uh, if patient moves, then images are retaken, and then that doubles the dose for the patient. Previous, pr prior to dental CBCT, dentists used to send their patients to radiology to get the image on the classical, the conventional. CT machine, like this one. You probably have seen the CT machine, OK? Uh, it is used mainly for abdomen pelvis. It is used for chest and it is for brain. So because at that time, there was no uh, special machine for dentistry, so uh, images used to be uh, obtained through the conventional CT machine, except that there are some shortcomings with this technique, and especially for the dose, it delivers a much higher dose than the new dental cone beam CT. So that's a very brief description of what the dentists do in imaging. 
So a lot of people always ask questions, are these dental x-rays necessary? Do we have to go through this regularly? Or, more important, do my children have to be x-rayed every time they go to dentist? Every time is no, it's not necessary. But x-rays are absolutely necessary when they are needed, because there's no other way to image the internal structures of the jaws or the soft tissue without x-rays. There's no alternative. Uh, if you look at in radiology, you can use MRI as an alternative sometimes, like for brain, instead of x-rays, because MRI has a lower health impact than x-rays, but not in the case of dentistry. Because the, the, the tooth, the teeth are made of bone, and you have to have some kind of radiation that goes through and gives you an image. So x-rays are necessary, but in, internationally, it, uh, we estimate that about 20 to 30 percent of x-rays taken in dental offices are not necessary sometimes. And many reasons for that. For example, you change a dentist. Okay, you go to another dentist, new dentist would like to go over again, image you again, and start to build up your file. So, patients who do not keep records of their films or their images would have to go through it again with a new dentist. That's one of the reasons. Sometimes the, 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 the images are not very good, they have to repeat them. There are many reasons. So you can imagine if we are if we have like one billion uh, X-ray examinations per year, and I suppose we're close to that. So twenty percent is is a lot. Is, that's a lot of examinations. And what is the health impact of that? Question mark because there are not too many studies in this field. So dental ray, dental X-rays are not always justified, and when they are. And if patients have to get these x-rays, the operators or the dentists have to make sure that the, the patients get the lowest doses. And there are techniques to lower the doses. And this is related to training. Well-trained technicians can get you the same image at a lower dose. And here, training is very important. And experience and training is very important. Some well-trained Operators can have the dose easily by playing with the beam parameters, the energy, the, uh, if, if it's a rotating uh, machine, the time. They can play on many parameters too. And unfortunately, there's not enough training, and operators are not always well trained to use these machines. Uh, I tried to skip the physics related to the X-rays, but I have to talk about absorber dose because probably you've heard about radiation. What is a radiation dose? A radiation dose is simply the amount of X-ray energy which is absorbed in tissue or absorbed in bone inside the body. That's what a dose is. It's just a, uh, a dose metric that we use uh, in physics to estimate approximately how much the, the body is going to receive. It has no link to biological effects, okay? And I'll talk about another unit. I'll skip this one. It's called the effective dose. This effective dose takes into account, it's a main unit in our field. It takes into account the amount of radiation energy that comes to your body and is absorbed there, the effectiveness of that radiation, because we have different types of radiation, and the effectiveness is different from X-rays to neutrons, to gammas, to alphas. And uh, fortunately, X-rays are the, among the lowest effective when it comes to biological effects. And then also, a third factor, which is tissue sensitivity. Different tissues have different sensitivities to tissue. Some tissues in our body are more sensitive to radiation than others. So the effective dose is a, a parameter that describes all the effects uh, in the human body, and that's what uh, we use to evaluate the impact uh, of the population. The only thing is that you cannot measure the effective dose. You can measure dose, what's coming to the body, and there are calculations where uh, we can determine this effective dose. 
tissue sensitivity. I said tissues have different sensitivities. After many, many years, you know, bio, our radiation biologists finally came up with a model about the relative uh, sensitivity of different tissues. So, lung, stomach, colon, bone marrow, and breast are the most sensitive parts of our body to radiation. These parts need to be protected more than the other parts. Gonads used to be high, but they found that in the end that gonads were not as sensitive as they thought, and gonad comes after. This factor, is, by the way, is what we call the weighting factor for tissue sensitivity. It gives you an idea which tissues and organs are more sensitive than others to radiation in general. And then you have a third group, thyroid, esophagus, bladder, liver. And then the fourth group, bone surface, skin, and brain. People would think the brain is very sensitive. But the brain has a lower density. It does not absorb as much radiation as uh, other tissues. And for dentistry, we have four that are important. Breast, thyroid, brain, and salivary, salivary glands. And if you look on the right, right here, although breast has a higher, much higher uh, weighting factor, but breast is far away from the beam. So when the head is imaged, the scattered radiation is low to the breast. Breast is important for chest x-rays, for example. People have to be very careful in chest x-ray not to do too many uh, chest x-rays because of the sensitivity of the breast which is higher than the rest of the body. But the most important probably is the salivary glands. That's what people are worried about in dentistry. Uh, that's the most exposed. And we'll see why. When I talk about dental x-rays, my personal worry is children. Because adults at a certain age, with this kind of dose, with the kind of doses we get in dentistry, except, of course, as I said, or if it's in the case of trauma or some where some procedures are needed, many procedures are needed, and uh, radiation, the radiation doses are high. If it's routine, I don't worry too much about adults because their tissues are less sensitive than children and their lifespan is less. A child starts getting x-rays around at age around 10, 12 years old, and, you know, we live up to the 80s, something like that, 80 years older. So that's a long time. And uh, if doses are relatively high, tumors could develop in 30, 40 years. So we have to worry about children a lot in dentistry. And parents who have children, when they take their children to a dental office, is one thing that you have to do is keep records of all the examinations of your kids. Because that way you can control and see whether there is an excess of radiation or is normal, etc. And that's something new even at the international level. Like in Europe right now, they have like booklets that they give to parents so that the parents can write down all the procedures that uh, the children uh, had in, in dentistry. If you don't do that, we don't have yet the safety culture to protect children against radiation. We don't. Children use all kinds of devices. They do a lot of things. And in addition, they have to go to the dentist. And that's where their first exposure start because we don't send children for uh, cardiac studies to see if their heart is beating, except in some cases. We don't send them for abdomen x-rays or brain uh, x-rays, etc. We send them to dental offices uh, for, uh, for treatment, for... Uh, uh, routine uh, monitoring, etc., and they're going to get X-rays, and these are the, and the, these are the X-rays they will get at early age. So that's one thing I think parents in the future will, or right now, they have to keep track of all the X-ray exposures that the children have. Output of the machines. If you compare the machines, how much radiation do they deliver? Intraoral is always the lowest. The one I showed at first, which is the classic dental machine. I, uh, if, if I compare it relatively to intraoral, you can see that a, a cephalo, uh, 
we call it a CEPH, okay, cephalometric X-rays. Profile is about six times. It's like taking six intraoral uh, X-rays. A panoramic that goes around to get the full image of the mouth is about 10. It's like taking 10 intraoral uh, uh, X-rays. Then you have the CEPH PA because when you image from the back to the front, the thickness is larger, so more radiation is needed, and that's why the uh, CEPH PA is much higher. And then you have the 3D, small field of view and large field of view. Small field of view is about 44, the equivalent of 44 dental x-rays. Large field of view is about, it's like taking 91. And if you don't do it with CBCT, if uh, the, the dentist doesn't have a CBCT machine and sends the patient to radiology, and the uh, medical CT is for upper jaw, it's 156 x-rays, and for the lower jaw, it's about the equivalent of 256 x-ray shots. So this picture shows that routine x-rays like intraoral are okay. You get one every year, two every year, sometimes one every two years. If, if you don't have any tooth decay, if you don't have any abnormalities, etc., you don't need x-rays. So people who have a good dental hygiene usually don't need many x-rays, but people who have tooth decay or have problems, chances are they will get a lot of x-rays uh, in a way in a certain period. And when we talk about dose, uh, the effective, we are the unit of effective dose is microsievert. And this is a comparison of the kind of effective doses we get for the different procedures. And you can see that the interoral is, is very low. The kind of image when they put that tube against your mouth and image, it's just, it's less than 1.5 microsievert. One microsievert, is a, very, is a very low dose, a very low effective dose, relatively. Uh, so 1.5 is okay, it doesn't really, but you see that's how the dose is getting higher for the different procedures. Panoramic can be as high as 24, so it's about 16 times the interoral. A self is about four times, and then dental CBCT can go from seven. When we say it goes from seven to 44, nine, but it depends on the procedure, it depends on the volume that is imaged. It depends on, on many parameters, but it can be as high as 449. Uh, large, a large field of view is even larger. And then the medical CT is really huge. It can go from 187 to 940 times the intraoral. And because all people get x-rays in dentistry, we have a very, very large number of people being exposed. And the collected doses are really high. So I see uh, patient safety in dentistry to be one of the major uh, population health issues in the future. It didn't used to be because years back we really worried about radiology or nuclear medicine or nuclear accidents, re uh, releasing radioactive, etc. But this field is gaining more and more interest, and I think uh, there will be a lot of research and there will be a lot, uh, a lot of guidelines. I think the guidelines are going to be upgraded to protect children especially, and um, it's a serious thing about children. We, they are, as I said, they, there are already many sources of radiation, and dental is important because this is regular, once a year, twice a year, a child gets x-rays. We can compare to chest x-rays. Chest x-rays is about 100 to 100, 200 microsieverts per examination. Natural radiation, what we get from the soil, what we get from cosmic rays, we have about approximately a dose of 3,000 microsieverts per year from natural radiation. The more they travel, the higher your natural dose. And of course, radiation is very popular these days because of the nuclear accident in Japan. Everybody is questioning the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, 
and everybody is suspecting that radiation is everywhere. So they are reluctant to eat fish. Some people are reluctant to eat fish because they think the Pacific is contaminated. I'm not going to eat that fish. But issues like this, nobody's thinking about it. And this is permanent. This is something that occurs. I shouldn't talk about fish. Anyway, so this gives you an idea about the kind of exposures we get in dentistry. And definitely, like CBCT should not be used on children. The other day I got a call from Alberta, and really a mother was really worried because she, she read about it. And she said her dentist prescribed a CBCT for her son. And I mean, she was shocked that a, a kid would undergo a CBCT for 3D. And when you look at the doses, it's a so she called us and, um, I, and uh, she gave me some information. So I cannot make a decision or I cannot judge what a dentist wants. So the best I could tell her was, are we done? Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. just going to rearrange this because okay. when you knocked it off, it got. Okay. Okay, thanks. So the, the best I could tell her is get a second opinion, go to another dentist, explain, you know, what the other dentist wants to say. And no, the second dentist thought that CBCT was not used, so he used a panoramic instead, lower dose. Okay. So, but how many parents really worry about their child getting a CBCT? A lot of people don't even know what is a CBCT. But those who know, they know that these doses are relatively higher than the conventional X-rays. If we look at the tissues and organs in the head, which ones are most affected by these X-rays? If you look at it, you can see that we worry about the red bone marrow, thyroid, salivary glands. We worry less about the brain or skin or bone surface. Remainder means everything else, the eyes and everything in the head. But if you look at this, salivary gland, 25% of the effective dose is in the salivary glands. And that's one of the main concerns in dental radiology. Risk. The risk diminishes with time. As we grow older, the risk is lower because chances of developing cancer are less as we grow older because usually tumors take 30 to 40 years to develop. So for someone who's like 60 or 70, no chance for a tumor to develop after having a dental uh, x-ray. But what about the child? The child and the teen, the risk of a child at the 10 is three times the, the, the risk of people around 20, 30 years old. Of course, at 80, you don't worry about radiation. You worry about many things, but not about radiation. But look at children. I, you know, I really wanted to talk about this because of children. Children should be really protected a lot better, and patients should, and parents should be very alert when it comes to dental x-rays. You have always to talk to the dentist, see if they, are they justified, yes, but keep track of their doses, keep track of, they will never give you the doses because usually operators are not trained really to give you the dose, but they can tell you at least your child had an intraoral bite wing or preoperative or whatever, write it down, write it down, when, the date, and when is the next one? If you see that three have been prescribed or four or five in one year, you're going to really worry and say, why so many x-rays in one year? And if they go to the other procedures, oh, we need a panoramic, or we need, uh, and especially if CBCT, if anybody talks about CBCT for children, immediately it should ring a bell. What's going on? Why does my child need a CBCT? He doesn't need a CBCT. He de he's not going to have an implant. He's not. Injured, unless there is an infection or something, it is justified if there is an infection. Otherwise, in general, for routine x-rays, no CBCT for children, for example. This table should really uh, make you think. Teenagers and children, we have to be very, very careful uh, about the, uh, the x-rays they get in dentistry. And, uh, and this is a very, very recent uh, study. So, recommendations. 
we hope that in all dental offices they only take x-rays when yeah. they are needed. My concern is probably the operators. I don't like to see operators using machines, just like robots, like, like, like we, an X-ray. we can get all kinds of x-rays without you know, an excellent training, because machines tell you what to do in general. But machines also give you the chance to adapt or to adjust in accordance to age, in accordance to uh, size. Some people have bigger heads and others, etc. You have to adapt. And how many operators are trained to adapt or to adjust the, the beam settings to the patient? I, can, I cannot say too many. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of them. And the thing about the imaging in general, when it comes to x-rays, if you see a very nice picture, you really have to worry. Because you can get nice pictures only at high doses. The higher the dose, the better the picture. And operators, sometimes they want to please their dentist and show them how great they are. Look at the, the, the picture I got you. Oh, and the dentist is very happy. Or the radiologist is very happy. But physicists know to obtain that, he had probably to double the current or something. Because it's impossible to have a very good picture with normal settings. And we catch that. Because I've inspected so many facilities. And when I look at the records and say, okay. This one tells me you really boosted the beam. There's no way you can get a picture like this with normal settings. So the best thing is to have a grainy picture, but an experienced dentist who can read through at half a dose or a quarter of a dose, he can see and say, okay, I'll get the information I want. I don't need a grainy picture. But that's how things are, unfortunately. Uh, I think operators need a lot of training. And I know that. Um, the BC Dental Association is doing a lot for training, and uh, soon they are they're going to put up uh, a training for CBCT. We worked on, uh, with them on that, and, uh, this, and nobody's doing it in Canada. I think that will be the first course on CBCT in Canada. And I have to say that they are really, they want to do something about patient safety, and they've been working hard to try to do it, and they've organized a lot of training. So, we're doing OK, but not as well as we would like. So you can see all these recommendations that we always say to operators. Get a good training. Use those reduction functions on machines. Avoid repeating exposures. That means set your patient right, position your patient right, and don't come back and say, oh, the picture is not good. I have to repeat it. And the danger with digital uh, machines is that you cannot trace back all these repeats because I can delete the picture. And I put the new one and say, okay, that's fine. Prior to that, they could not hide it because films, you use a film, a second film, a third film, and then you have to show where the films are. So if you mess up one film, you have to go back and ask for a second film, and then someone knows that you repeated. Not in digital. We can play with the images, we can delete them, we, et cetera, et cetera. So nobody can, uh, I mean, in inspections, it's, there's no way we, uh, we can see all these repeats. And usually they show repeat zero. It's impossible to have repeat zero. But they still do, no, we have repeat zero. We're doing everything is perfect. In radiology, it's not possible to have repeat zero. We accept up to 5 to 10 percent of repeats. But on children, I'd rather not see any repeats at all because it doubles or triples the dose to the child. Keep x-ray records. I hope that they always keep these records so that we can go back to these records and see how many, how many x-rays a patient had last year, this year, etc., to see if we can plan for the next x-rays, etc. And I suppose most of them keep uh, records, but do they keep all the records? I don't know. And the training in dental radiography, first of all, dental imaging is not easy. It's not easy at all. People would think that, oh, it's straightforward. The operator pushes a button, but say, no, it doesn't work like that. There are a lot of parameters that are important in the quality of dental imaging. X-ray machines, they are supposed to be controlled once a year at loss, at least. Control all the beam parameters against manufacturer specifications. 
In BC, I can say that we're lucky that uh, there's a group that does that. They go around. It doesn't have to be every year for dental. It's every year for radiology. For dental, it could be like for enteral every five years. For a panoramic, it could be every three years. For CBCT, one to uh, every two years, let's say. Uh, but it is done. It is done. There, there are people who go to all the clinics and they check the the output, they check the beam, etc. And it's working okay. Uh, there are too many uh, clinics. Uh, I was talking to someone from the uh, dental association the other day, and I was amazed to know that in BC alone, we have more than 200 CBCT machines. And because I know people in other provinces, I asked in uh, Ontario and everything, no province has that many CBCT machines. So I suppose a lot of them also are used for cosmetic purposes, okay, uh, etc. But 200 machines, at least. I mean, it was 200 like a year or two years ago. It's probably a lot. So we have a lot of uh, machines, and chances are there are a lot of X-ray examinations in the province. But patients, uh, I mean parents, especially with their children, they should keep records of all the X-ray examinations that their children had until after 16 years old, 20, when they can do it themselves and they can keep these records. But at younger age, from 10 to 16, parents should keep records and then give them to their children later. That's the only way to know whether the children are being excessively exposed or not. And the reason why it has to be done in dental and not in other is because in dental is no control. I mean, it's very hard to control what's going on in dentistry. Okay, people assume that dental X-rays are routine; they are needed. Nobody questions that. Go ahead. No, uh, X-rays are X-rays, and uh, when children receive X-rays, especially yeah, in the head, it should be a concern. And again. We don't have any standards. How many x-rays can you get? Like three interorals per day, one panoramic, one panoramic every three years, etc. They are not, because it depends on, on, the, on, on the patient. Uh, a healthy child doesn't need x-rays, barely, maybe one every three years. But a child that has care, that has a tooth decay, etc., will need more. So you cannot say children should have this many. For interoral with very low doses, we can say, well, you know, two or three, or it's okay. And those are okay in general because of the low effective dose. But panoramic, you don't want a child to have panoramic very frequently. Maybe most once every three years, five years. I mean, CBCT maybe once in a lifetime, maximum two, uh, etc. So it depends. So that's why also a discussion with uh, the dentist and with the offer is good for the parents to ask. Why are you doing these x-rays? Are they justified? Are you keeping the records? Can you tell me what the dose is, etc.? Write this down and keep it for your child, for the children. It will become an issue in five, ten years at some point. And at some point, parents will say, I wish at that time I had kept, uh, taken, yeah, kept records. So do it now so that you don't have to uh, ask yourself why I didn't do it back then. Do we have guidelines? We do. Health Canada has a safety code which is outdated, unfortunately, was uh, updated in 2000. It doesn't take into account the 3D, which is the most important. So that's what uh, people have. The Canadian Dental Association has also some guidelines. So reading these is already good for the dentist and for the uh, operator so that they know at least what they have to do for patient safety, for their own safety and for the quality of their practice. So because we don't have a 3D, so what we did last year, and working in collaboration with the Dental Association, BC Dental Association, we developed guidance for dental cone beam CT, for CBCT, and we added recently radiation issue notes on the proper use of CBCT. So now we have approximately what we need uh, so that people know exactly what to do to ensure that patient safety is taken into account in the practice. But the best publication probably comes from Europe because Europe, they have 
so many physicists that do a lot of research. And like the US and Canada, where the number of physicists is, number is lower and uh, not too much time to do this kind of research. But in Europe, I think they get it all together. I don't know how many countries, about 15 or 20. And then they uh, got a group, and they looked at CBCT, and they spent like four or five years developing guidelines for CBCT alone. So they published this marvelous document that everybody uses in the world. And uh, it tells everything about CBCT. It tells everything that the dentist should know, operators should know, what patients should know. So it tells it all. And we're glad that we have this document. And everything is, of course, all these documents are online, and they can be da downloaded free of charge. Some websites of interest. There is one good website from the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's called the Radiation Protection of Patients. It uh, addresses all issues related to radiation, radiology, nuclear medicine, radiotherapy, and dentistry. You can get a lot of information from it. There is also another website that the that European group who worked on CBCT. They have a very good website where they provide a lot of material for education. The third one is the Society for Pediatric Radiology in the US. And that's why I put it is because for children, how to protect children. And another one for children called Image Gently. There's a, a new wave of, uh, for uh, patient safety. And they call they called this uh, initiative Image Gently. That means done overexposed children. And they put a lot of information for parents to know when they take their children to a hospital or to a clinic, what kind of questions to ask, what kind of data to get from uh, the hospital, etc., so that you know that your patients are not uh, excessively exposed to radiation when they go for uh, a diagnosis. And that's it. Thank you very much. I hope uh, it was useful to, to you. If you have any questions, I think we can answer uh, some. Most of the questions I get are about Fukushima. <laughs> I mean, daily, two or three, can I eat this, can I eat that, is it our air, etc. So. so this is a change for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I have a question. I have oh, a okay. phone, so I get to ask mine first. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering, so you mentioned guidelines around um, optimal use of yep. x-ray um, procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any enforcement of that? Like you mentioned that you sometimes do visits. What, what's the province? BCDA, role? BC Dental Association, which is in a way the regulatory body in BC for dentistry, they have a contract with a group and okay, a very brilliant engineer, really brilliant. He's so brilliant that he's asked everywhere in Canada to go and do inspection. That guy goes around all year to inspect the machines and to look at the records, those records and everything. Uh, of course, if he had more people and trained like him, yeah, they could do a lot more. But it's a lot, a lot better than uh, anybody can imagine. And um, we work with them sometimes, yes. The enforcement is later. In a way, it's the assistance, is assisting the users to apply uh, the, the proper safety procedures and to make sure, and also to make sure that their machines are working properly. Because with time, the machines age. Yes, there is enforcement. It's not legal. It's not the kind of legal enforcement like the police would do, but it's a technical enforcement. And I would say it in the, to me, it's like 90% satisfying. And not all the provinces have that, I can tell you. This guy goes to New Brunswick and spends sometimes four or five weeks doing the same job for uh, New Brunswick, and he's called in other provinces also. Thank you. That was fun. Um, so my question involves um, thinking back to the days when uh, little kids would stand on the x-ray uh, to see whether the shoes fit sort of thing. And, um, and, and so thinking forward, you mentioned that the dentist should be able to interpret a grainy um, image. image. Yep. Okay, so my question then is, 
what mm, kind of guidelines or what feedback mechanisms exist at the training level of dental technicians and the folks that actually do this? Is there any you know, quality control around that? There is a, a training which is organized. Um, it's not really frequent, but uh, at least once a year by the BC Dental Association. And this guy I was talking about, who does the inspection, he, he gives a train. So he talks about image quality and dose. You want better quality, you higher the dose. So you have to find a compromise, OK? And that's what we teach in health physics. And we like to have people who, are, who have some experience in imaging, so they don't need a perfect image to make a diagnosis. But it takes time. So the, uh, I think the older generation, they have that experience. They can see a film and immediately know exactly what they want. Whether it's grainy or bad image, they know. But younger ones, recent graduates, it takes them time. So they have to be ended and supervised by these experienced uh, radiologists and dentists. Yeah. It's moving ahead. It's improving regularly, because now it's an international issue. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of documents, there's a lot of guidance, there are a lot of courses. It's improving a lot in comparison to 10, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. But on the other hand, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, there was only film. We didn't have 3D, we didn't have all these things, and uh, we didn't have so many examinations. So we have more exposure now, but more quality at the same time. But I think parents have an essential role of keeping track of the exposure. Because you take your child from one dentist to another, the second dentist is not supposed, he doesn't know that this, this kid had already five exposures last year with another dentist. So it's for the parents uh, to do this job. Whenever they change dentists or something, to make sure that they kept their films or they kept the images and take them to the new dentist so that he doesn't have to repeat the same exposure, for example. It's not perfect, but it's improving. And I think BCDA is doing everything they can to continuously improve. Um, I'm going to ask about the, the costs associated with these images. And are dentists charging for them? And are they able to charge more for the more sophisticated imaging? And how does that play into Well, the, the, the insurance companies are keeping an eye on the, on the price because you know when people submit their files for reimbursement, okay. Insurance companies are not easy. So they know that. And sometimes also they have, dentists have to get the appro approval of the insurance company before they do it. But CBCT is a problem because up to last year, there was, no, there was nothing about re uh, uh, reimbursement. So we, um, uh, the dental association met with the insurance companies and we attended that. Now they're getting a better uh, picture about uh, CBCT because it's, it's expensive. So if a patient gets more than one CBCT in three or four years, insurance companies are not going to pay for it. So yeah, there is this, uh, this thing that uh, dentists cannot exaggerate in taking uh, uh, x-rays. That's one good thing about it. So I'm just wondering, do you think that the advent of digital imaging has led to a decrease in the dose that is used, like in your guideline, for example? Do you think that the, in your guideline, the dose that Fabio recommended in the guideline 20 years ago, has it been reduced because now it can be done digitally? It, it can go either way. It's really the, the practice and the operator. You can take two operators. You give film to one, and you give digital to the other. It could be high-low. It could be low-high. Because it's, it's really a myth that going from film to digital, suddenly the doses are going to be lower. Not necessarily. There are so many parameters involved that the image receptor, which is the film, plays a role, but it's not really the essential role. The essential role is the machine, the beam settings, the training of the operator, etc. A lot of people think that with digital, we are, you know, receiving less. You know. When an image uh, requires a certain dose, there's nothing you can do about it. 
the good thing about digital is that you can improve the resolution, you can improve the contrast by playing with the colors and everything, because it's digital. And you cannot do that with film. Film, once you have it and it's developed, that's it, you cannot touch it. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. In digital, you can improve by changing the brightness, etc. Just like your images on the computer. You can change the brightness, you can change. But you cannot change the resolution, for example. Because the resolution is number of pixels per unit area. How many pixels do you have? A lot of pixels means a larger, a larger dose. That's what I was talking about. If you have a grainy image, that means you have a density of pixels, which is less. If you have a beautiful image, that means you already have a high resolution and you use the high dose. Uh, I like digital, but I'm afraid of the use of digital. If people, for example, for the repeats, I will never know who repeats x-rays because the images can be deleted and you cannot delete with. The other thing is that a film is a document that you keep, it's a record, even for legal issues. A film, you cannot change it. You cannot play with the film. But with digital, you can play with the digital image and change it a little bit. You can add artifacts. You can remove artifacts. You can, that's the danger of imaging. It's electronic. So you can play with it the way you want. In, with a film, no. In the film, no matter what you do, you cannot change that, uh, that image. So there are advantages and disadvantages uh, for both. And I don't prefer this one or that one. The, the good thing about digital, actually, is you can send your image. If you're traveling and you're in Tokyo, you can send your image to your doctor in BC. In a few seconds, he gets it, and he looks at it, and you can say, you're OK. With film, no. It would take a week for that film to be sent to your doctor. So again, you have a lot of advantages, but you have also <coughs> some shortcomings. Hmm? A couple of questions. Thanks for an interesting talk. One is that um, esophagus isn't one of the higher exposure, whereas oh, the, the torso yeah. is. So that, that was a question. No, the table I, I gave is for all imaging. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily uh, apply to, to dental. As I said, I circled the ones that are important to okay. dentistry. Okay, so the, my second question is uh, in regard to the point about parents being the ones, obviously, the people who hold the health and welfare of their children the most of keeping track of these dental x-rays. Yeah. It, it, I think about then the public health messaging of that, meaning that how are parents, you know, oftentimes parents defer those kinds of medical dental decisions to their health professional. And if they change dentists for their children, it's hard to, re well, demand, request, whatever you call it, the, the dental x-ray records. And then if the new dentists say, well, new dental x-rays, panoramic, whatever is required of your child, the parent is supposed to say, oh, wait a minute, he's got this done two years ago. And yes, so it's, it's a hard thing. So and whose responsibility is it to provide that sort of public health messaging for parents? It's, it's really a discussion you have. Uh, a dentist can, can, can uh, have a justification to say, OK, this was done two years ago, and this is what it shows. But what I want to see is this, 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 because your child is different. Two years ago, his dentition was different than it is today. I'm going to look at something that this picture doesn't show, and that's, how, uh, that's why I need this uh, experience. So it's really a discussion, a dialogue. It's not really uh, challenging the dentist. No, I don't think we should ever challenge a dentist, but we want to know why. We want to justify it. And if you have your records and the new dentist is happy with the pictures, see the advantage of avoiding additional exposures. Okay. But the, the, it's, it's the role of the, of the parents because nobody can, can, can do it. I mean, you change country and you know that your files from the other country are not going to come to the new dentist. I mean, you may have to uh, go again through format series or something. Uh, and that's the advantage of keeping records. I think it's, it's good. It's, it's a good way for parents to participate to, their, to the safety of their children. Not doing it, you don't gain anything from it. But doing it, there's a lot of gain. And I don't think uh, parents should be afraid to talk to dentists and not challenge, but say, 
you know, I've been reading about this and that, and I'm worried about my child being exposed again. Uh, do, does he really need? Let the dentist explain. Yeah, spend some time and explain why these x-rays are necessary. I mean, even for adults. It doesn't, it's not only children, but also adults should question, uh, uh, should talk to the, the, to the dentist to understand why these x-rays are needed. I have these x-rays from last year. Explain to me why I need these, etc. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a good collaboration between the, those who provide the healthcare uh, and the parents. For, the, for reasons that you have stated, so does the guideline require dentists to keep film records or can do whatever they want? If they have film records, the, uh, I think they need to keep them. As long as the patient is with that dentist, the file will stay uh, in, the, in the dentist. And they have to keep these files, yeah. The, and the film is, is the main piece. I mean, in dental, in dental radiology, the image is the main piece. And that's when you know what you need to keep. But of course, the patient takes a copy. There's always a copy with the patient. Great. I think we're going to wrap up a few minutes early and get back out into that sunshine. Thank you very much, Rashid. Thank you. It was a pleasure.